open up the word. Will you pray with me? Father, we are grateful um, that we have had uh, so much to celebrate thus far. We are thankful for this opportunity to worship. It is our prayer that that worship continues as we open up your word and meditate upon it. Father, it is our prayer that as we gather and meditate upon your word, it would transform us, that it would conform us into the men and women, boys and girls that you have called us to be. Father, we pray that anything that would keep that from happening would be broken down, would be removed. Father, may we hear your voice, and may we walk out of here ready to obey it. Father, as the one preaching, I pray I would be faithful to the task that you have given me, that this would be about you speaking to your people, that this would be about your words, not mine. We pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, the one who died and rose again, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <coughs> you're probably uh, familiar with this. Uh, you're probably perhaps tired of hearing this. Uh, but we are a church that sits on the corner of South <coughs> Avenue D. You were just to simply read our street sign, we are a church that sits on the corner of saved. I like our focus in January to always be, what, what does it mean for us to be a church that sits on the corner of saved? What should happen in and through a church that sits on the corner of saved? We're in our third week of attempting to answer that question, and this morning we are going to look at this idea that we are to grow together as disciples. As my prayer at the end of this, we would see that Jesus' words are, are not a buffet table, where we just get to pick and choose the things that we like and leave the others for someone else. And that Jesus' words are not suggestions. And we get to just pick the ones we're going to obey and choose to ignore the others. <coughs> so, if, if Jesus truly is our Lord and Savior, we must pay close attention to His instructions and then obey them. Amen? Amen? And as we do, we grow as disciples. I would ask that you would join me. Matthew chapter 7, picking it up at verse 24. Matthew chapter 7, picking it up at verse 24. <coughs> Our passage this morning comes at the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It is the longest recorded section of Jesus' teaching. If you were to flip the pages before ours, if, if you've got a red-letter Bible, you would see chapter 5 and chapter 6 and chapter 7 are filled with the words of Jesus. And after instructing his disciples on what it looks like to be a disciple, he offers up today's passage. If you're ready to hear it, give me a loud amen. amen. It's a bit dangerous saying that today, because as we'll find out, because we're now reading it, we're expected to obey it. Um, please don't plug your ears. Still hear it, and let us commit to obeying it. Picking it up at verse 24. Therefore, as a great Summary, a great conclusion to the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain came down, 
The streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who put his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crowd. Verse 28, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Amen. Amen. Those who hear these words and put them into practice, build on rock. Before we dive into this, I, I do want to make a brief connection to where we've been in the pre previous weeks. Of what it means to be a church that sits on the corner of say, First, we looked at this idea that it begins with us submitting our lives to Jesus. I saw a great visual of that this morning as we witnessed Blake baptized it, as he submitted his life to Jesus Christ. For us to be the church on the corner of saved, it begins with the submission to Jesus, where we all need to confess, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And there's only one Savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. From there, after submitting to Jesus, we need to correct, connect to Christian community. The Bible paints this beautiful picture, not of people following Jesus in isolation. Not of people following Jesus all on their own. <coughs> but the scriptures paint this picture of people following Jesus in community. Because the truth is, you can't do it on your own. And then today, we'll see this need to grow together as disciples. We don't get the option of submitting to Jesus, connecting to Christian community, and then remaining the same. <coughs> it's just not an option. We submit to Jesus Christ, we connect to Christian community, and then today we see that we begin to grow as disciples. Disciples, we begin to look more and more like our Savior. And that's that's the sermon, folks. Jesus' words are pretty clear. It's one of those sermons where you, you're almost in danger by talking about it more because Jesus' words were so clear, right? You could just stand up and read it and I could sit down. Um, let's do a little more than that so we can see how that applies to us. Jesus' words... Plain and simple, that we need to become more like Christ. How does that happen? Well, these folks sat at his feet. They, they heard his words. And then he told them, you've now got to go live this out. While we're not sitting at the feet of Jesus in person, I'm not looking directly at his sandals this morning, we have the words of God. We have the teachings of Christ. We need to sit with them. We need to hear them. And then obey them. And Jesus gives us two options. And this is a message reserved for us, folks, because we're the ones that are hearing the words of Jesus. We've got two options. We could hear them and obey them. And Jesus says you're building on rock. Or we could hear them and do nothing. And Jesus saying, you're building on sand. And you guys know this already. The storms of life will come. They haven't already. They may be coming for you this morning. <coughs> the question is, are you wise or are you foolish? As the storms hit, will you 
remain standing. I have a few questions to ask for this morning. My first is, what is the fundamental aim of church? What are we aiming for? What, what's at the center of the target that we're here to achieve? You might think of church and first things that pop into your head are music. Depending on your church background, it might be committees. It might be potluck lunches. Um, you might think of uncomfortable pews, right? Uh, you might think of the mints that we pass out at the back. Uh, you might think of kids' programs. Uh, if you've got, you know, a, a little bit more of a sophisticated answer, you might say things like evangelism or, or missions or, or fellowship. If you were to ask me, um, feel free to ask me. Uh, what is the fundamental uh, aim of the church? I would tell you, our fundamental aim is for the church to form a community into the image of Christ. That, that's our goal. And it's a, it's a slight play of words for me here. That we're to form a community into the image of Christ, meaning the community gathered in this room. Our goal is to form us form you into the image of Christ. But I also mean that in a bigger sense, that this church exists to form our entire community into the image of Christ. Amen. That is our fundamental aim. Now, if we do that right, If we're forming people into the image of Christ, all these other things begin to overflow from it. Yes, there's potluck lunches, and yes, there's, there's music, and yes, there's worship, and yes, there's all these other things. But at its core, we're attempting to mold and shape people into the image of Christ. And it's from that idea, I want to jump from our passage this morning for a brief moment. I, I have it on the screen, so no need to, to flip there. But this is a, a word from the Apostle Paul to the church in Galatians, in, in chapter 4, verse 19. He's speaking to that church. He says, my dear children, he says, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. It's a vivid image there. And it's a passage, it's a verse dripping with Paul's pastoral heart. Right? Where, where he's in physical pain waiting and expecting this church to be formed into the image of Christ. And, and this is a verse um, that serves as a guide for me. As a pastor, there's a temptation to be distracted by many things. You give me one-on-one, -on -one, I can talk about some of those. Right? There, there's... There's a tendency as a pastor to be fixated on certain things. But this is a verse that on a real, tangible, boots on the ground, personal level, this is a verse that guides me. It's the job of the church to be formed into the image of Christ. And then it's, it's my job. To guide us in that direction. That we wouldn't be distracted. We wouldn't be fixated on other things. But that we would, together would walk closer to Jesus in a way that it's molding us into his image. <coughs> then we, we have to get practical on some level, okay? Matthew 7 tells us we've got to hear Jesus' words and 
obey them. Galatians 4.19 is telling us that when we do that, we're, we're shaped and formed into the image of Christ. And that's all of our jobs, to, to be formed into the image of Christ. It's my job to, to guide us into that direction. Well, how do we get there? Again, this is, this is something that you would expect to hear in church, and I, and I put it in the language of New Year's resolutions, right? Uh, many of us are attempting to, to, to lose some weight to get a little bit healthier in the New Year, so I phrased this in that way. You need a healthy diet of Bible reading and a healthy exercise plan of Bible living. Well, give me some head nods. I worked hard on that, right? That's, that's good. Uh, take a picture of that. You know, tweet it out. Uh, put that on Instagram. Uh, um, you don't have to give me credit for it. Say, say you came up with it. But it, it's worth sharing. You, you need a healthy diet of Bible reading and a healthy exer exercise plan of Bible reading. Right? That's how we step into the end of Matthew chapter 7. These folks were sitting at the feet of Jesus. He goes, now that you've heard this, go and do it. This will mature you. This will shape you into my image. Well, well, how do we follow in that blueprint? Well, we, we hold the word of God in our hands, and, and we read it, and then we live it out. How we get shaped into the image of Christ. Again, you're saying, well, Pastor Jeff, um, depending on your age, it may be PJ, um, how do we do this? And, and, and I've got three questions for us that you've heard before, um, and you're going to hear them again this morning. We're going to have a healthy diet of Bible reading. Um, I have three questions that I think you need to answer. Not think about. Not ponder. These are questions you need to answer. We're going to be serious about a healthy diet of Bible reading. You need to answer the questions, when, where, and what? When are you going to read the Bible? Where are you going to read the Bible? And what in the Bible are you going to read? This seems real basic, folks, but if, if, if we were meeting for lunch, um, we would have some conversation before we met, right? Uh, like, what day? When, when are we going to meet? And then we'd have to settle on where and what time, right? And I would put that information into my phone. It would be on my calendar. And we would meet. Why? B because I planned it. We agreed to it. We set a time and a place. Right? You say, 11.30, Chewy's. I'll be there. <clears throat> Not on Sunday, because we, we, we don't finish that quickly, but, you know, some other time. Uh, so, so when? This is, this is basic, but let, let us play with this for a little bit. When are you going to read the Bible? I'm going to assume we're going to do it every day, right? But what time of every day? You're going to do it first when you wake up? It's going to be after the cup of coffee? Are you going to... Do it at, at noon, or you're going to do it at 3 p.m., right? I always think earlier is better, but I'm not going to be a stickler on that, right? When are you going to read? Where? Again, I think this helps, right? If, if I say I'm going to read it at 8 o'clock, where? Is that going to be at my kitchen table? Is that going to be in the living room? Name the time and place. Treat it like any other appointment you would in your week. And then what are you going to read? I think we all can testify this. At times, the Bible can be an intimidating book. In reality, it's not even a book. It's a library. It's 66 books that tell us the story of God. <laughs> we could have the when and the where settled and we're at, we're at our coffee table, we've got the, the cup of coffee, and then we pick it up, and we're like, oh boy. <laughs> Where to start? The success rate skyrockets when we know when, where, and what we're going to read. 
Now you guys can pull out your, your Google machines and, and you can Google Bible reading plans and you'll get flooded with time-tested, uh, time-proven Bible reading plans. Pick one and go for it. If that's what it's going to take for you. Uh, you can find plenty of them and I would recommend them all. I'll offer you another option. And again, you've heard this before. Here you go again. For me, um, when I was 18 years old and I committed my life to Jesus Christ as a, a freshman in college, I was in the living room uh, with a man that became the mentor in my life that gave me an appetite and a hunger for reading the Word of God. And we began with slow, methodical readings of particular books. Later in life, this really became transformative for me when I was tasked with preaching for the first time. And I said, oh boy. Mm -hmm. Right? And I had four Sundays in a row that I was going to preach. Uh, I knew in advance. It was on the calendar. It was coming. And, and I picked up the Bible and I said, what could I do in four weeks? Well, the book of Colossians is four chapters. I can do a sermon from each chapter of Colossians. And that began for me a habit of slowly reading through the Bible. I picked up Colossians 1, then I read it. I mean, let's be honest, reading Colossians 1, the slowest reader, it's going to take you four minutes. Five minutes, I'll give some grace there, five minutes. <laughs> You can read the whole thing in 18 minutes. I can guarantee you that. I've timed it plenty of times before. Read chapter 1. Plenty of things that just burst off the page. Things that gripped my heart. Things that I wasn't living out. Things I began to pray for. Things I began today. I'm going to live out what I see in Colossians 1. I didn't exhaust it after day 1. Came back to it. Read it again. Prayed through it. Attempted to live it out. After a week of reading Colossians 1 every day, it began to get into me. It had a grip on my heart and, and mind. And then the second week rolled around, and, and I did this through Colossians chapter 2. And long story short, a, a month of slowly digesting Colossians 4 has cemented that book in my heart and mind. I can tell you, and I'll make this quick. If you ask me a question about following Jesus or about faith, my first instinct is something from Colossians. Because that book, those four chapters, <coughs> have been working on me for over a decade. I'm, you know, I, if you notice, hopefully, I don't preach all my sermons from Colossians. I've, I've moved on to other aspects of the Bible, but I've got a decade of Colossians being inside my soul. I offer that up to you. If you're still with me, give me an amen. amen. So what's the fundamental aim of the church? That we are attempting to be a community formed into the image of Christ. How does that happen? Well, we have to get the words of Christ in us. And we have to obey them. Then, right. how do we know when we're successful? You know, if you're going to ask me to do something, how do I know when I'm we're doing it right? We got some things we can measure, right? We could say. We're successful when there's lots of people in attendance. Uh, we could say, we know we're successful when there's a lot of dollars in the offering plate. We, we could say, you know, we're successful when we have to start building more of a building. Or we could say, you know, we're successful when we start to have really snazzy programs. Hopefully you're picking up. I'd say no, that's not it to all of those things. That's 
not how we know when we're successful. But how I would answer that is a little less easy to define. It's hard to measure when we're successful in being formed into a community that looks like Jesus Christ. It's a little harder because it doesn't graph and chart very well. But we're successful when on Sunday mornings or, or Wednesday nights or Tuesday afternoons as you're, you're gathering in homes around meals or whenever it is, we know we're being successful when we look around us and we see people living like Christ. We know we're successful when we look around and we see Jesus-like things happening. I love this passage that these folks hear Jesus preach. They hear him put the exclamation on it and they all go, we never heard that before. <laughs> That's coming from somebody with authority. That can happen here, folks, right? Where, where we can see Jesus-like things happen and go, I'm amazed by that. That's a church living out the teachings of Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, after the baptism, I, I was getting prepared to come back out here, and um, I think I overheard Trey referencing the fact that numerous people have been joining our church recently. Um, this week I, I, I flipped through uh, uh, our, our membership files, and since the beginning of the school year, uh, we've had nine families officially join the church. And there's more to come. But we've had nine since the start of the school year. Nine families joined the church. If you counted husband, wife, and kiddos, that's 27 additions to our church since school started. 27. I praise God for that. I, I really do. Um, I praise God for it. But that's not the end goal. I mean, 27 additions in Crawford, Texas, right? That's amazing. That's a thing of God. But what we're aiming for is for those 27 people to be fully submitted to Jesus Christ, to be fully connected to Christian community, and to be growing and growing and growing in Christ likeness. Amen. That's the goal. A little harder to measure, but essential. We'll know we're successful when we begin to look around and see Jesus-like things. That takes all of us. But hear me say, it starts with you. Right? And, and I mean you, right? It's not the text is y'all. I mean you. <coughs> it starts with you. The wise person builds on rock. The foolish person builds on sand. When the storms of life hit you, and they will, will you be found wise or foolish? <coughs> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful uh, for your grace, but this is a collection of sinners, people that fall short of your glory, but you have provided us a Savior in Jesus Christ. You have provided us forgiveness and eternal life through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. May this collected group, may we submit our lives to you. May we repent of the way, old way of life. 
And may we walk in the life that you have provided for us. Father, may we not do it alone, but may we walk in obedience and submission together. Father, continue to work in us, continue to mold us and shape us into the people in the church that you have called us to be. We pray these things. The one who makes it possible, the one who gives us grace, the one who is God with us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.